Okay. Today's session is the CPU or the central processing unit. It is the part of the computer where operations are made. We need to understand fully that without the CPU, we're pretty much dead in the water. The processor is installed on the motherboard itself and determines the system's computing power. Just like your engine, you can rev it up as fast as you can and you can go as slow as possible. So it does have its capabilities to go either fast or slow. Just like any car, you wouldn't want to be running it at 160 miles per hour just because your speedometer says that you're not gonna be using that at all times. In this session, we're going to learn the features and the role of a CPU overall. Can anybody explain to me what they believe, compare it maybe to the human organ, what would be the CPU? If we're looking at, we said the motherboard is the backbone with the nervous system and everything that connects to the whole computer. What would be the CPU equivalent to? The brain. The brain. brain. brain of human being. Okay, but what part of the brain? Because if you notice, the brain has long-term memory, which we can describe that as your hard drive. You have your short-term memory, which is comparable to your RAM. So you would agree then the central processing unit would be that part of the brain that's able to move your hand, send the signals to the actual backbone to get the things going. See how I'm talking about? So now the CPU processed it, whatever I'm seeing, even your eyes, from some strange reason, I don't know, I gotta take the guy's word for it, but some weird reason your eye sees everything backwards and your brain is so smart, it actually flips it around and you can see it the right way. Don't ask me, I only gotta take their word for it. Either which way, that's what this does here. This basically controls everything that's going on. Anything that has to happen must happen through here at one point or time. It gets to the other peripherals and or the motherboard eventually, but it must go through here. That's why it's called the central processing unit. Overall, at the end of this session, we're gonna be able to hopefully describe the various types of processors, articulate how to select the actual one that we need, identify the CPU and explain its purpose and requirements to keep it functioning, choose the appropriate cooling methods and the name, the steps replacing, installing the actual processor Finally, identify the uh, common pitfalls and given a set of symptoms, we're gonna be able to identify the common CPU problems and hopefully describe and solve them. Questions so far? Anyone excited? I am. Overall, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you are, that's good. CPU is one of my favorite subjects because overall the processor is the one uh, that is, it, as we stated, installed in the motherboard. It determines the system's overall computing power. How much can it actually process? Uh, the two major brands that we've seen out there is Intel so, and AMD. There is some other ones out there, but these are the big boys. These are the ones that you'll see in, in the majority of the stuff. Can anybody tell me where would you see more AMD than Intel, if anyone knows that one? Besides being on a cheap computer, I'm not trying to get to the servers. Cheap. No, I just told you it was cheap, so why? Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Point of like sale the... systems. It's Maybe inside games. the computer, so I'll give you that much of a hint. It's not gonna. It, we know it's a central. It's a CPU also, so it's a CPU. I'm giving you that much of a hint, but it is used a lot inside the computer. That CPU is used in even in an Intel. PC. I'm going to even give you that hit. That may even get you tingling even more. Uh, gamers, I'm upset with you because you should be able to know. And if nobody understands what I mean by gamers and haven't gotten a clue what I'm talking about, it is your GPU. A lot of these people that are creating the GPUs out there, which is your graphics interface card, the high-end ones, believe it or not, a lot of them are using the AMD chip. That is the processor that's mounted on that graphics card. One of the reasons that they've been able to stay afloat is that they're still selling their chips like crazy. Even though if it's inside an Intel, a lot of these processors that are out there, the features affect overall the performance, the capability with the motherboard, including the clock speed, the processor speed, the socket chipset, everything is integrated and must go through the processor. 
the processes are our architecture and the multiple multiple processes that it can do. It also has now memory cache, supports virtualization and integrated graf graphics inside itself. No more going to that bus. It actually has an integrated graphics card inside. So now I don't have to go down to the actual motherboard to be able to do anything. We'll get into that details now. CPU features include the input and output unit of the, the control unit, the ALUs, which is the arithmetic logical unit, the registers, as we learned, registers is like buffer, internal memory caches and buses. The processors are measured by frequency and multiplier itself. We'll get into the details and the intricacies of that in this lesson. Before selecting and installing a processor, you must match the processor to the system itself. We have various cooling methods that we're gonna review, which include heat sinks, li liquid cooling, and even uh, mineral oil to be able to keep it cool. We're also gonna review the dust preventive maintenance and case fans and expansion cards. Lastly, the steps for installing, depending on the different models and versions of the CPU. And lastly, the common issues that we may present to themselves. So all of these things that I just mentioned require adaptability and growth mindset. As we know, adaptability is one of the things, if you notice, keeps on popping up over and over. Without this, it's gonna be very, very hard for us to be able to adapt to a given situation. I just told you there is two different types of main uh, processes out there that are being sold. One of them is the actual Intel. You have your AMD. So it is, it is also frustrating that on top of what is there, they just don't keep the darn thing the same shape or the amount of pins. Once again, it is because of the of the next generation that's coming out. A lot of them have either more pins and obviously require a different bus. And since your motherboard won't be able to use it on purpose, they have removed the ability of you being able to, to stick another processor that the, the actual motherboard cannot handle. Why? Because previous to this, believe it or not, all the other Intel chips and AMD were the exact same shape. So the technician might have taken it out from one computer to the other and not noted which is this processor and believed that it could go into this other motherboard and it can't. So they got rid of that mistake. Now it's frustrating because it's trying to fit Humpty Dumpty into a round hole. Overall, Kevin, if you can help me with this one for the Intel CPUs. Intel desktop and laptop processors are, are sold under Core, Pentium, and Celeron brands. Their very low power portable smartphone chips are branded Atom. Their high-end server chips are called Xeon. Some laptop processors are packaged into the Sentinel technology, which interconnect the processor, chipset, and wireless adapter in one unit to improve laptop performance. Thank you. Overall, as we see, the Xeon ones is a key note that we need to take here is for the high-end servers themselves. The Centrino ones are the ones, uh, the different types that are available. We'll see here the, over the years, you had the four bit processor itself. Then over in the eighties is when the 32 bit processors. And if I recall from when I finally figured out why it's called 86 is because it came out in 85, 86 kind of, and that's why they call it an 86 instead of a 32. That's what somebody told me. You know, they'll tell you, I've only been misinformed, never, you know, I'm never wrong, just misinformed or miss, you know, understood. It only works. Otherwise, these are the key players that are out here when it was in the 90s, when finally the 64 slash 32 bit processors were out. Finally, in 2009, the i3s, i5, i7, pure 64 bit. Obviously, there is some features that the Intel was hanging their, their heads on, and we'll get into the details in the intricacies of that one. Thu, if you can help me out here with the AMD processor. I 
to van. My throat is not that good, so I don't think I can help with that. I'm sorry, I'm... I said my throat is like a little bit hurt, so... Oh, okay. Not a problem. Shilo, can you help me out, bro? Uh, AMD CPUs. Advanced micro devices are popular in the game markets due to its advanced in the integrated graphics processing unit. AMD uses different sockets than Intel, so the motherboard must be designed for one processor or the other. Current AMD families are FX, Phenom, Athlon, and Sempron. For desktops and Athlon, Turion, V-Series, Phenom, and Sempron for laptops. Thank you. So as we know, it's basically those are just the models, just like you have the Hyundai or whatever. Those are just the models that are out there. As we can see in this slide here, it gets a little bit more into the names itself, the Athlon. It lets you know that the Athlon is the platinum series of it for the gamings. You have the Athlon series, which is for the digital medias. Your mainstream one, which is the regular Athlon instead of the X2, is just the Athlon Pelau, which means nothing at the end. And then you have the real cheap, cheap little mini Cooper, or whatever you want to call it, Sempron. A lot of these are obviously depending on how much you want. Overall, this is here a depiction of a motherboard. You have your CPU, obviously, this is so we could understand the bus itself. You have your clock generator over here. You have your actual north bridge, your south bridge. You have your expansion slots. We have your PCI Express expansion slots versus the slower slots down here. You have your actual clock for the expansion crystal. You understand now how we have a clock generator here. Now we got the other clock that we were talking about for this expansion bus running different speeds, right? Next, we have your super IO, your input output. You have your flash ROM, which connects to the bus itself here. The super IO is obviously to alleviate the south bridge because since the PCI slots and some other slots that are on here are a little bit faster than the serial parallel and floppy and all these other slower guys, the super IO himself takes care of that operation. Only need to go over here to do whatever else he needs to, to be able to talk between here and here, here and here. Questions or doubts? Does that everybody understand the logic of why? Nobody understands the logic of why. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why is there, um, well, it's, it says, uh, connected to the south bridge here on, to the left, uh, it says expansion or PCI bus, but mm -hmm. then up on the north bridge, it says mm -hmm. uh, PCI Express is here. So, Correct. but uh, I was under the assumption that the PCIs were like kind of the same, but the PCI regular was the old one and the PCI Express was the new one, but I thought they used the same, uh, the same slots. Good question. Very good question. So your PCI slot that's here, or in the PCI or expansion bus that's down here would have PCI and PCI with the letter X. That variance is only in, in reference to the PCI, if I remember was 32 or 16 and the PCI X was 64 or 32. I can't, I always forget those numbers. But all it does is still the old antiquated uh, bus, sorry, the PCI X is 32 bit, while the PCI, if I recall, then would be 16. But it's still, you'll see here, let me get you a, a picture. Ah, go back, come back, come back to where you were. The PCI X uh, slot, I'm not sure if you can see that. Can you see that? Yes. 
You can uh, see the picture with the PCI. No, no, I mean, I see, I see a, a selection of lots of pictures. Okay, good. All right, so that's it. This here is the actual PCIX board itself. You'll see it's still the white one. It's not the new one. It's the old antiquated bus, so it's not as fast as, as the new one. So the PCI, the PCIX, these are here. Now the AGP and the PCI Express or PCIe is up here. Much faster processors, right? The AGP slots and the PCIe, especially the PCIe has a GPU built in. So it's, got, it's much faster, so it will talk to the North Bridge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the reason why this does this, everyone, please remember, prior to the invention of the North Bridge, South Bridge, and then the Superman over here, Super IO, everything was riding the bus. Since it all rode the bus, everything was as slow as the slowest link. With creating these, you can say little captains or colonels, or whatever you want to call these out here, Dealing with these other devices, it helps alleviate the load to the CPU. CPU doesn't have to handle those things. Just like your hand, if you put it in fire, it doesn't have to ask the brain, should I move? Does it? Does your brain need to say yes? If you put your hand in fire by mistake, by mistake, because if you force it, that's a different issue. That's your own personal problem. By mistake, if you hit something hot, do you does it the signal need to reach your brain? It's instinct, pretty much, to move it once the pain it's is. It's your felt. backbone. It's your backbone, not instinct, but we go with that. It's your backbone. And your nervous system never reaches the brain. It gets all the way up, maybe up to here, if I recall from from science class. So you could always remember, it's never going to get to the brain up here. It's going to stop somewhere here, and if necessary. When necessary, it talks to the CPU. I hope that helps understand why these things were invented and why they are there. All right. So over here, we got the basic components of a Pentium chip. We can see and pretend that this is that little square. You have the input output unit itself, which brings it up to from the bus. You have the control unit. You can, can say that's uh, considered like the traffic controller. You have your internal memory cache, your AOUs, and your registers overall within the chip. This is connections that are going on. So what is the uh, IO unit? Well, that is the guy that manages the instructions. Like I said a moment, entering in it, in, leaving the actual processor. That's the one that's touching the motherboard here, coming in and out. The control unit itself manages all activities inside. So after you come in here, I am the cop. I'm the controller of everywhere that's going on here. Next thing that we need to understand is that most of them have one or more ALUs, arithmetic logical units, which actually perform the logical comparisons and calculations that must happen. Last here, we have or not last, we have next the registers themselves. Just like in a memory, we have register or buffer memory. This is basically what it is. It's a small holding area on the processor chip to be able to hold the data instructions and information for the ALU current, currently processing. You can think of this as a invention to avoid the bus. I'm gonna say that guy a hundred times until I can beat it over your heads. Everything here that has been invented is to get off the bus. I'm tired of writing this guy as it is. I got to create a multiplier and God only knows so many inventions out here. I got a super IO in the back corner. Now I'm going to be able to do some things. I have now registers in here. I also have internal memory cache that holds the data instructions that's waiting for the ALU to process. This alleviates for me to leave, go through the actual North Bridge to get to the, the memory. That's latency. That's literally whatever, how many inches away, that's energy and electricity that must go down into this green thing, which is the motherboard, go out into this uh, North Bridge, 
leave the North Bridge, go to the memory. There's a traffic jam. Jesus, how many people are here in the memory? Come back. And now he starts talking back. That's not necessary with the current processors. They are able to do and alleviate the problem and create the illusion that is faster because it is. It has the information in here. We understand, yes, eventually stuff starts going out there. If it has to go to the actual um, video card, if it has to go to the sound card, stuff starts leaving the processor to go do stuff. But it's actual calculations and stuff it happens within the actual processor. This is why they're so fast now. Otherwise, they would have been slow as turkey as they were before. Any questions in reference to the IO unit, control unit, AOUs, registers, your internal memory cache, or the bus itself? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Does that mean the um, IO unit manages the data that is being received from the MCC? IO unit, yes. The okay. IO unit comes, but the MCC, if I remember correctly, that's already going past the North Bridge. It is. In between the memory and the North Bridge is where the actual MCC lies. It's a memory oh. control unit. So the actual memory control unit that he has inside is this guy. Oh, so okay. This is his own internal, you could consider it MCC, but it's called a control unit. Your input output unit is the one that's going into the motherboard. Then this guy here is similar to an MCC, but he's inside the chip because there's there's memory in here. There's cache memory, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Register, and then you have the actual AOUs, the ones that do the processing. Question. Oh, yes, one, one question. Um, can you go back to the last slide one more time? To the picture, yeah, sure. Yeah, so when we get into things like overclocking, it's the ALUs that we're talking about, right? That is who gets overclocked. That would okay. be a logical assumption, yes. That's who gets overclocked, because that's the guy that's doing the processing, that part of the processor of the whole chip. Good question. Any other questions before we go on to the next slide? All right, so who can help me out here with this slide? Walkins. Okay, um, back to, con to consider one slide in your CPU. Speed at which the, upper, the processor operates internally measures in, I guess that's gigahertz. Uh, clock speed, clock to speed, uh, the processor support, motherboard restrictions, CPU architecture, memory cache, socket and chipset the processor can use, memory capability, you know, compatibility, uh, multi-processing abilities, dual processor, multi-core processing, multi-threading, CPU features, uh, support for virtualization, integrated graphics and security. Thank you. Definitely, yeah, we need to understand which speed the clock supports, the motherboard restrictions that we may have. We're gonna see uh, pictures of the actual processors, what they look like, the capabilities of the actual uh, of the actual processor itself and the security features of virtualization because without these things being taken into account, we may buy the wrong thing, especially if we want security or virtualization. Now, what is this clock speed that we wanna talk about so much? This is basically the crystal, the one that we said that determines it. So as I said, the car, when you wanna go and rev it up or not, this is where it happens. Megahertz is millions of, cy millions of cycles per second. Yeah, that's what I meant. Gigahertz obviously then would be like mega is a thousand, you can say a thousand megahertz, or I guess, what is that, a trillion? I don't know, billion? Damn, damn. Yes, Diego, learn your math, billion. 
a CPU clock is obviously determined by the max speed. And obviously, as I said, it's not always going to be there at the top speed. What makes this possible? The new thing is the clock multiplier. That's what's running in there and allows you to actually rev up this engine and do what is necessary. Without this, you wouldn't be able to do that. So now the new ones that are out there, the majority are 32, no longer those 44-bit processors. That doesn't happen anymore. Next uh, ones are your 64 bits. And it, it obviously means in reference to the amount of bits it can handle at a time, depending on the actual operating system and your requirements you, you have, you're gonna need to make sure you match one with the other. Doesn't matter if your motherboard is able to do it. If you don't have a, a Windows 64-bit OS, you just bought a 64-bit processor for nothing. It will work, most likely, because the OS can, but no, it won't work, sorry. The other way around, you can, but you can't do it the other, you can't put 32 on a 64. Can't do that, can't do it. <laughs> Hybrid ones are the ones that are 86, 64. They can handle both OSs, but on a regular 32-bit, it is a, a, a force. You, you can only handle that type of OS. Um. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it, is there any way that you could explain the, the difference between 32 and 64 bit process and how they relate to the OS in a different way? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Uh, we, we agree a bit is either a zero or a one. Everyone agree? A bit is a zero or a one. So, yep. if, so 32 bit means that at a time I can send 32 zeros or one through that processor. So that remember the clock cycle? So the moment that I go once through there, it can handle 32 zeros and ones at a time. With a 64 bit processor, it can handle 64 zeros and ones at a time, much is doubling the amount of information that can be thrown into that processor. Did that help? Yes, but now how does that relate to the, the OS? Now the o operating system must be able to handle that type, just like your BIOS, needs to have that encyclopedia to understand what everything is here. The OS must understand how to do this. If the operating system is a Windows 95 with 32 bit kernel, it could only handle 32 bits of instruction at a time. Won't be able to send or talk to in, in machine language, it won't be able to process 64 bits at a time if it's a 32-bit processor. So it needs to be able to un understand how it has to have its own dictionary, which it calls um, AOUs. No, um, that's wrong. What was it? It's its own little dictionary. Anybody can help me out there. Is it firmware? Yeah. No, it's not from where's the operating system itself. It has its own dictionary of the amount of drivers that it has inside. I, it escaped me at this moment, but I, as soon as I remember, I'll let you guys know. But overall, the processor could only handle what it was made to do. So when they code it, the processor either handles 32 or 64. Sorry, the, the OS can only handle either 32 or 64. Okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then we have uh, on our computer now like program files and one of them is program files just normal like it is for operating system and the other we is x86 for some mm -hmm. reason. So the Correct. different folders and Correct. it should handle both. So how does that work? Good question. So 
in your computer at this time, you most likely either have a 64-bit processor or a hybrid processor. Most likely, you'll have a 64-bit processor. It will require an operating system that handles only 64 bits at a time. Now, the operating system and the actual processor can mimic or simulate a 32-bit processing. So if you install an application that's an, an antiquated one that can only be run at 32 bits at a time, the processor can actually create that virtual 32-bit application to run without a problem. It will just simulate and only send 32 bits at a time. And that's why you have a folder that's called Program 86, which has all your 32-bit applications. And then your regular uh, folder that says Program Files, which is your 64-bit applications installed. Okay, I understood, thank you. Next, what Intel has been <laughs> until 2017, they've been holding their hat on this one for years. Multi-threading is obviously where each processor or processes is creating two threads at a time. Instead of only doing one task at one time, it makes one CPU act like if it's two. Intel calls it hyper-threading, which is actually multi-threading. Same thing, different color. Same exact thing, not to be confused with something we're about to talk about now. So hyper-threading, multi-threading, same exact word. It's one CPU acting as two. Questions on hyper-threading? All right, not to be confused with a multi-core processor. This is a combination of multiple CPUs or cores into a single chip itself, increasing obviously the power because now you don't have one, you either have four, six, depending on the amount of cores that are available. You could just imagine the more cores, the more processing power you have. Questions? Doubts? So what's the variance between multi-core and multi-threading? Um, multi-threading is like a virtual doubling of mm -hmm. the processors and uh, multi-core is actually physical parts of the real chip. Exactly, that is exactly what we need to be able to understand and decipher. So when we buy something as a six core multi-core and it's hyper-threading at the same time, as we saw in the previous slide on the chip, it said on the chip HT. So if it had been a, a multi-core HT, then we know that not only is it have multiple cores, you could always double it at that point. So if it had four cores and it's able to do hyper-threading, it's equivalent to eight. Guys, I do just notice, sorry about that. My bell just rang here, uh, I had it on mute. It was vibrating, it is 110. I forgot to give you guys a five minute break. That was the question that we had. Yeah, but I think I answered it. You can confirm it for me. Uh, Fadil asks, and he's probably not back yet. So he asks, is the chips on a processor the same as the one on RAM? And I, I said no, because they're circuits, but they, they serve different purposes. So they can look similar, but they're not the same. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they are technically a type of RAM. Chip, yeah. Yes. But it's not, it's not going to be the same sh shape or it is not DDR, it's none of that stuff. It is RAM per se, but it's not RAM RAM. Right, That's since that RAM can only just save and this one is doing other, it has other functions. So it, Yeah, this is RAM inside the actual CPU. In other words, memory inside the CPU is okay. still volatile, just like RAM. Hopefully, Fidel is here to hear that. Right. Uh, I have a away. question. How would you explain the core part when they see like quad core? Or like You see the like physical, uh, as, as someone mentioned earlier, you see how physically there's four chips here? That's, yeah. That's 
quad core. That's four CPUs inside, physical CPUs inside one chip. What if it's not like a, is it always going to be a quad or is it going to be no, a different You type? got dual core, so it'll only be two. Quad core, which is four. Six core, eight core. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right. So the, the word coincides with the amount of CPUs you have inside or a uh, cores you have. Most misspoke there because it's not AOUs. It has nothing to do with that. So the core itself, you can pretend there's a little micro CPU in here and everything that we described earlier is inside that chip. Yeah, that's small. So is that also the same yesterday when we talked about a single double? Is that we talked about? Uh, is that this? that has nothing to do with that's memory? This here core processor means it physically has four CPUs. If it's quad core, if it's dual core, it means it has two CPUs inside one major unit, two central processing units inside or cores. It looks like a motherboard, but it's like in miniature, like one of those Russian dolls, kind of, you know. Yeah, because this is the whole chip that we saw that we're used to. That little square, they zoomed in real good in that, and that's that's just inside that metal thing. All right, question, other question about multi-core. Yes, I got it. Yeah, I know. Single or double-sided around, is that? I'm sorry. Uh, yesterday I was confused about single and the double sided around. Uh, is that well, uh, you, you try to you... compare you try to compare apples and oranges for deal. Single and double sided RAM is is basically a way to identify how the RAM actually looks and where the actual everything of the components is, is actually on the RAM stick because it could be single sided or it could be double sided. So, mm -hmm. and then DDR is the rate in which it's moved. That's the, that's not the same as how it looks physically. That's another thing. So it's layers mm -hmm. on top of, I see what you're doing and they, they don't, they're not, they're not the same. Yeah. So you, you have your single sided, your double sided uh, RAM. And we said that the double-sided RAM could be physically that it's in, in, in the two sides, so it has two ranks. Or it could be that it's all on one side, but it still has two ranks, and that's why it's still called double-sided. Otherwise, that has nothing to do with here. This is basically the CPU, the, the, the function of a CPU. Inside this regular chip, there is four CPUs. That's how small they're being able to make these CPUs now. So one main big CPU has, in this case here, this is a quad core. That's the four cores, four CPUs in the center. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What are those, um, just on the right side of those four cores, what is that big uh, thing with, it's like a black grill or something? Mm. And, and uh, that port, anybody want to take a wild guess if it is a port, an input-output port? I would think it's that, memory. It's an input-output port. It's a port. It's not memory. So if it's an input-output port, port, what's a port? Anyone? A port is equivalent to a serial port, a parallel port. It's a way to get in and out, right? If we get in and out of the CPU, what is the in and out? I just love torturing people with the words, giving them the actual definition. Hopefully the picture helps you. What is the in and out on a CPU? What is the unit that goes in and out? The IO unit? Yes. The input output unit. So now you know. Input output David unit itself up. inside. So that would be your I.O. unit. That's what goes towards the motherboard. 
Oh. What about that uh, square? There's a, a a fifth square on the bottom of that chip. That's now you're uh, asking me for too much. What I look like an engineer, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Physically, I can't tell you all the ones. I can I can see this here and understand this one here. Now I can't tell you all these without being able to read it. This one is easy. This is easy here, but I can't tell you the rest. But the function of it is more of being able to understand. You don't, they're never going to ask you to physically be, on, be able to look at a, uh, the inside of a chip, unless if you're a, 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 an engineer that's going to be doing these things. You just need to understand what the core is. What does multi-core mean? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, your L1s, L2s, L3s. We have here... Michael. Please help me out, Michael, here with this. You slide. got it. Memory cache, L1, L2, and L3. Very high speed static RAM, SRAM, that preloads as many instructions as possible from the RAM and keeps copies of already run instructions and data in case CPU needs to work on them again. Each core in a processor has its own L1 and L2 caches. L1 is smaller with very short access times. It splits into L1D for data and L1I for instructions. L2 is bigger in capacity than L1 with relatively longer access times. All cores might share an L3 cache within the processor package. Almost all current CPUs have an integrated memory controller, IMC, included in the processor package. It enables faster control over things like the large L3 caches shared among multiple cores. It provides significant increase in system performance. Thank you. So as we see here, it does have RAM inside. As uh, we understand, we don't want to go to the bus. See, if I go to the bus, I am slow. So now that we've been able to create things that are smaller and smaller, geniuses came up with the idea of saying, hey, why don't we just put it inside here? I understand, yes, eventually stuff's got to go outside, but why don't we do it in here? So you have your own memory controller. You got your core one. Then you have your L1 cache. So that chip that you saw earlier, remember those other pieces that you were looking at? So if, now you could understand what that was. So you had the four chips, then you have your L2s, and then you must have another chip that's the L3. Those are the chips that you were looking at, those extra little chips earlier. I can't, I couldn't tell you which one was which. I knew what it was, but can't tell you which one's which. I don't know. Now, from what we can understand, the actual core chip itself has an L1 cache memory. So I can be able to do stuff. It's not that big, but once again, so I could be able to do stuff. Then I got another, if I got another layer here, which is the layer two. And lastly, the shared common pool, so that when these fours start running out of memory in those layers, they have this one. And obviously all this is to alleviate going to the bus. If I don't have to ride the bus, I, the signal stays in here, it's solid. I don't have to go all the way outside, past my North Bridge, past the other uh, MCC that's out there, or IMC, and, and then go to the memory. All of it happens in here. Questions, doubts? So, oh, sorry, secure. I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. So, like, when it, um, I don't know if it relates to anything like that, but the only other time I've, um, like, heard of the word cache or cache whatever you want to say however you want to say it, is like when you like um like on your internet browser like um you know like you they say like oh mm -hmm. you clear it like when you clear your, it in your browser or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah what what is how does is that in any way related or is there like a similarity oh um, yeah i don't know i'm just i'm just trying to like uh assimilate it's, it's a study. very very similar thing the variance is that this cache is inside your actually your cache, however you want to call it, uh, is inside the actual processor in the now now versus okay. the cache that you speak of is in your hard drive 
So when you open up your Internet Explorer, you don't have a connection to your Internet and you go to Google, you always see Google for some stupid reason. Not until you hit search do you realize that you don't have actual access to the Internet at that moment. It says it fails because then it can't actually do something. That's what that cache is. It's a, it's a uh, information that has been stored on your hard drive to mimic the actual site. So unless if it receives a refresh from the actual site, it won't refresh what's supposed to be in that content. It just uses its cache. In this case, this cache is used to alleviate the necessary to go back into the motherboard. This cache is just to store, as we heard a moment ago, the layer one stores bits of information. One side is for the data instruction for the other. So actual data versus the instructions of doing stuff. Okay. All this so is like, just, mm -hmm. go ahead. So, so like, say like we were working on something like you say you're video, like you're editing a video. Like if we didn't have that cache in that, like in that CPU, you would, that was it would lag. be a whole. That was that lag that how many FPS is that you can get nowadays? That's the guy right there is helping you with, with that lag and the processing. And a lot of them have an internal GPU on the, on the actual video card. So that CPU that's there has this in, here, in it too. Oh, okay. So that actual graphics card has its own GPU or which is really a CPU. It's just a graphic processing unit. It's still a CPU. And it has this inside of it. So now that it has inside, now I don't have to go from the actual video card through the expansion bus, go through the North Bridge, past the MCC, into the memory, get to the CPU, come back. No, nothing. I stay here in my card. I got my own CPU. I don't got to talk to nobody. I know what I got to do. If I need anything from the CPU, I go and get the data that's necessary and bring it. But once again, it's a payload of data. So once, if you're talking about, if you're in a, in a video game, the only thing that's necessary at that point is the data coming in and out. The refresh rate and stuff like that is all coming in and being processed. So since I have cash, it's in a now now. Yeah, you guys ever see uh, a video in the internet and then all of a sudden the guy starts going, and he's back. Why? Because unfortunately that sound couldn't catch up to the video and the video finally catched up to the sound. That's what's going on. But in this case, you don't have that lag. The GPU is able to uh, handle all the load and ensure that whoever needs the information is getting the information. Questions, doubts? Um, I'm just thinking, how does it uh, interact with RAM then? Because I thought that it's the function of RAM in that case to store the data and provide it Agreed. to CPU. Of course, that is completely correct. But do you agree that if I put RAM inside this chip, I don't, I don't lose time leaving the CPU, going through the bus to get to the actual north bridge to then turn left to pass the actual memory controller. I'm doing this on purpose so you can understand, although how much on long I'm taking, that's how long it's taking in nanoseconds for it to travel out of that CPU, the old CPUs to go down, out, turn a left, get to the memory, do whatever it needs to do, come back. See, that takes time, it takes nanoseconds. <laughs> but it takes time. So what they created was internally these chips, since they were able to create them smaller and smaller, they put memory inside the CPU. Okay. So mm -hmm. how do they interact? Uh, is it like uh, the internal I'm, one is erased faster or what happens? Uh, it's It all depends on where it needs to go. It will send it eventually to the memory if it needs to send it to the memory. But at the same time, it will, let's say it's coming from the memory, right? So you can understand. So it came from the memory, it passed. Now it's coming into the actual uh, input output unit, right? So let's go back over here so we can understand. I think I, this may help out a little bit more. 
if I can find it. Here we go. So I came from the bus, right? Here's a memory with the information that maybe came from the mouse, for instance, right? So the memory is sending the information of the mouse. Now that I have it in here, this cache, whatever is coming in here, will cache the instructions that are coming in at the same time that I continue to move so that I don't have to keep on going back to the memory and it's all coming in here. It, even if, if it becomes a traffic jam, this extra memory will help alleviate the, the problem that I'm having on the bus. Since I'm, I'm slow at the bus, I'm able to cache all this information in here and do what's necessary inside the unit. If I go back to the bus, it, it slows down everything because all that in extra interaction of updating the RAM that needs to be updated slows down while here it stays here and leaves when necessary to the actual unit that needs the actual signal. If it's coming from your hard drive, it's gonna go through the actual um, north bridge eventually, right? Cause it's gonna go from the, depending on the peripheral you have from the south bridge into the north bridge goes through the memory, comes in here. Once again, since there's a lot of information, your video card, there's just a plethora of information of ones and zeros, all this extra information that would be a slow down, here we call the Palmetto, a slow down or traffic jam, this extra cache alleviates the, tra the traffic jam that's happening outside. It allows it to, to, to be able to speed up all the extra stuff that it needs to do. Without this, it would have been very slow because it needs to have everything still back to its original place, which was just there. So now you got only so much memory here. There's not like an exaggerated amount of memory. That's why your computer itself has memory to a certain degree. This is just so much RAM in here. It's not an exaggerated amount of, of, of information that's being processed and held there. It's the now now, it, only the now now. So it's like something very, very small that allows the CPU to work faster. <laughs> okay. To process information, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The then now is is in the RAM. The now now is in the CPU. I don't know if anybody knows X, the Spaceballs reference, but the then now, what's about to happen is in the RAM. What's happening is in here. What's about to happen is in the RAM or what just happened. So the future and the past is going on within the RAM. The now now, what just happened now, now, is inside here, the now now. Did that make sense to anybody? Hopefully it did. Why would it have the then now? Anybody wanna tell me why would it have the then now? The past, why does the RAM have the past? It's holding apps that are in the background. Or sending information to the video card, sending information to the hard drive, right? refreshing because what what the CPU just said, I've got to now send it to the sound. So what, what's coming in here through the mic, going up into the CPU through the RAM, right? Comes back, goes in nanoseconds back through your speakers. All that happens in just nanoseconds, but it's got a route. It has to route through only one way to get there. So it must go through something. And it's only one route. And eventually it goes through the CPU, comes back out. You guys are not expected to know all the routes, guys. You just need to understand who are the major players. You have your CPU, you have your memory, you have your North Bridge, your Super IO, your South Bridge, your uh, memory control unit. Any other questions? Okay, let's go back. So that was the cache one, two, and three. As we saw here is a visual representation of the information. 
Next, for security, security, let's see who we can have here help out. Fathia, if you can please help out. Um, <coughs> security, execute disable bit EDB is a security built into a processor referred to as XD in Intel and NX in AMD processors. It can work with the operating system to designate an area of memory for holding data or instructions. When an area is designated for data, instructions stored in this area are not executed, thus preventing a buffer overflow attack by malicious software, which attempts to run its code from an area of memory assigned to another program for its data. EDB requires a compatible OS it can be enabled using the BIOS or UEFI setup screen. Even though EDB can stop malware from executing, it cannot remove it. You still need to use anti-malware software to remove the malware. Thank you. So not to confuse yourselves too much, as everybody likes to do, Intel calls it XD, AMD calls it an X. Still the same thing, it's still an executable disable bit or for the AMD, which means no execute uh, processor. As for the Intel, it means ex the executable disable or something like that, executable disable bit. Still does exact same thing. What does that mean? So when what a virus as we can agree is still zeros and ones. Does everyone agree a virus would be a zero and one for a computer? Yes. So now that we know that, and we learn what a processor does, we learn that it also keeps track of what it's doing. Since it knows what it's doing, it has an extra security feature called the XD executable disabled bit. What does this mean? So I'm keeping track. Then all of a sudden something comes in out of nowhere and says, hey, you're supposed to do this. The heck? Nah, I, I don't remember saying we we're supposed to be doing that. Where did that come from? It stops it. It doesn't kill the virus, but it will stop it from going into the kernel. We're gonna learn what the kernel is, we're gonna learn. So when it goes into the actual CPU and it's there, it's gonna stop it because this zero and one never was in my AOU, this didn't exist. How in the world did it get here? It stops it. But you need some type of malware to uh, antivirus device to be able to remove it from the hard drive. It's in the hard drive, going through the memory, gets there and it says, well, nah, not gonna happen. You look too drunk. You're not invited to this party, get out. That's basically what's happening. Questions or doubts? Yeah, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. This will happen at the um, during the post. No, this is going to happen when the process reaches when the zero and one comes into the processor. So, so like at startup, like when well, you depending start where the virus is, it could okay. be a root. It could be uh, a regular virus that when you open an application or when you open the Word document, whatever it is. In, in like any type of like line of work, like when we start working or something, would we have to, um, like would there be instances where we have to like take care of like viruses and have to download some type of software to get rid of it? Uh, there, there is, uh, at least when I used to be in the help desk, thing called Stinger and some other uh, emergency patches that are out there. A lot of these guys, though, have uh, already a handle of it. So let's say if there is a major virus uh, where it, it comes out and it's a, a day one, you know, virus or day zero virus, basically when, when that comes out, the provider will send out an emergency patch, not wait for the next week's uh, weekly dump. Same thing with the operating system. If the operating system has it, instead of waiting for its usual Super Thursday files, it will send out the, the emergency file. Any other questions? 
Any, everyone understand what anti-malware software is or malware is? Nope. It's programs like Norton, right? Anti-malware, yes, it's Norton. Yes, correct. It's, 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 what happened is before they used to call, there was only viruses out there. And then obviously they be, there's malicious software that's out there now. So not only is there viruses that do something to your computers, there's um, adware too. There's, so now they came up to, with the word malware, malicious software. Be that it's a virus, adware, a Trojan, whatever it is, a worm, all that encompasses the word malware, all of them, the whole family. So just a fancy way, well, it's really, it, in other words, a virus can be a malware, but malware is not always a virus. Next, virtualization. Who can help me out here with this one? Benjamin. All right, virtualization in integrated graphics. Support for virtualization. A computer can use software to create and manage multiple virtual machines and their virtual devices. Most processors sold today support virtualization and the feature must be enabled in UEFI BIOS setup. Integrated graphics. A processor might include an integrated GPU, a graphics processing unit GPU, or is a processor that manipulates graphic data to the to form the images on a monitor screen. The GPU might be on a video card on the motherboard or embedded in the CPU package. When inside the CPU package, it is called integrated graphics. Many AMD processors in all the Intel second generations and higher processors have integrated graphics. Once again, I don't want to ride that bus. I hate the bus. He's too slow. <laughs> it's amazing what they've come up with. Overall, with this integrated graphics card inside of it, it doesn't have to go out. Obviously, that would be the one that you see that's in the back of your motherboard or, sorry, the back of your PC itself, not an expansion slot. And although, at the same time, you will find on the v very fancy GPU cards, the ones that are on the actual expansion uh, expansion slot, that will have its own GPU with its own integrated uh, graphics. Any questions? Doubts? Now, as for the actual virtualization, that will be turned on. Just like the security feature, you could turn that on within the BIOS itself to allow for virtualization. What virtualization means, it creates a virtual environment or a virtual computer, a fake computer inside your com in your existing operating system. A lot of times uh, software programmers and or people who want to test out viruses per se to see the damage it does and see if their the latest patch works, they can sandbox it inside a virtual environment and ensure that the actual operating system, the real operating system never really gets affected. It, in essence, you could actually disconnect it and not allow it to even go out into the internet, disconnecting it from the real world. This virtual environment allows to facilitate the process, especially when it comes to servers. Servers, a lot of the time, are been thrown out there and they have a specific house application, which now no longer requires to be installed on your computer. Using a virtual computer, they can actually allow you to connect to this virtual environment, which contains Windows and all the applications that you need without virtualization uh, inside the actual processor capabilities or it turned on on the actual BIOS. You can kiss your butt can bike because of the fact if it can't handle it, it will either be too slow or it will crash. In reference to the sockets itself, we have the AMD pin grid array, you have the Intel landing grid array, and you have overall your CPU socket with thermal paste applied. You can see that's a dollop there. It's a small little amount. It shouldn't be too much. When you when you push it down, it will obviously stretch out and, and take more space, but you can't put too, too much because if it's too thick, then it's not going to be able to thermally pass it. It's going to start just staying inside the chip. In here, you have the Intel sockets. Now, I love Intel because they made it easy. 
Anybody want to tell me just by looking at this chart, if you didn't read, shame on you, but hopefully you read this in your book, 1150, what does LGA 1150 mean to you? What does LGA mean? That's the model. Landing Isn't that that Landing grid, 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 grid array. array, correct. So now you know what it looks like. If it says LGA, it's an Intel socket. It's going to tell you the model. So you're looking on the internet. You don't got a picture. You know exactly what you're looking at because it says LGA. So it's got to be an Intel chip that has the landing grid array. Now we got past that one. 1150, can anybody want to guess what that means? How many pins are there? Ding, ding. If we read a little further towards the right, you'll see that it says 1150. I love Intel because this is why. Look how easy. Look at 1155 LGA. Oh, wow. It has 1155 pins. LGA 2011. How many pins? Wow, 2011. Thank you. Now I don't have to memorize the ridiculous amount of pins. Why didn't you do that with the memory? I don't know. Don't ask me. I want to go kill somebody because whoever created this could have done the same thing with the actual pins or anything else. Now that I feel warm and fuzzy and I got all my stress out, any questions on the various <laughs> of the models? <laughs> Obviously, your later models are down here. You have your i7s on the lower end over here, and then you have your LGA 775s. Those are the ones with the duo extremes and quad processors. Questions, doubts? Would the amount of pins result in higher performance? So like a LGA 2011 be a higher performance processor? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. We could even look at that. Just if, if we look at the chart, you'll see the 1150 supports DDR3. And then we can go down to the 2011. What does it support? DDR3 and 4. And then you go back to 1156, go down to 1156. Since it's lower than 2011, what a coincidence. It only supports TDR3. And I even go lower on the number, 775. What does it support? DDR3, DDR2. It makes sense, right? Just like you said, the more pins it has, the more capability of commands and input to come in. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, are we gonna have to know each and every single one of these on the Intel sockets or? The, hmm. no. I know they'll ask you a question and try to trick you in reference, if anything, to try to compare an LGA to an AMD or an yeah. AMD to a, a motherboard that doesn't fit. Just make sure you know the, the naming Pattern convention like if you see lga you know it's intel if they take if they give you an amd chip it's not going to fit on an intel board okay. and now those are the sockets on the board you hear you see here they're all h r h b t i'm going to get into an easy way and i call it amfm you'll see right right now where i'm going to get to so here's your lgas and what they look like you can see the different shapes and patterns. Once again, this is not a mandate to understand and look at them, but it, over the years, when you get in here, you by the time you even figure out which one's which, they're gonna change it anyways on you. So just take it as it is. Such so different shapes, you can see they can't fit. If you can't fit, you must have quit. Now, what do I mean by AM, FM? If it says either AM, or FM, it's gotta be the AMD chip. One of the ways I can remember any of these things and these names is that AM, FM or radio, I like to call it AM, FM radio, is the AMD sockets. And what I hate about it, as you can see, a a FM2, what does that mean? God only knows how many holes that has. FM2 plus, FM2, FM1, AM3 plus, AM three, but obviously the three and the two and the one map represents the generation. So you could obviously get that out of the way. That is the, one of the easiest things you can tell, but as for the different processor families and the details and intricacies, it's still a little bit harder to memorize. Questions, doubts, if you notice, if they ever ask you, 
you'll notice here, look, again, same exact thing is happening. The first generation, I don't know why this happened, but this one turned into a 904 to prove me wrong, which is a cheaper one. And then the plus is 906. Why is FM1 more than FM2 for the holes or pins? Because they cheap made a cheaper one. I'm going to be straight out for you. That's a cheaper one compared to the FM2, which is their expensive one. This is a cheaper one. This is the more expensive one of the FM2. It's the same uh, FM2. I meant also for FM1 because this is 905 and then FM2 is just 904. Agreed. FM1, right? So if you want to compare apples to as apples, sorry. <laughs> FM1 and FM2 plus is where you could actually compare apples to apples. If that makes any sense. This is the cheapest version of FM2. The regular FM2 plus would be where you can see that it's the higher end one. The FM2 is a cheaper one and it has less pins the cheapest version of the FM2s. Just to mess with you. They got nothing better to do. I always say it's just to mess with you. Same thing here. You'll see that AMD 3s or AM3s has 941s. Then you have the AM3 plus 942. This one's easy though to memorize because the plus has 42 while minus one is 41. Obviously the third generation is the ones, the latest and greatest. Questions, doubts? You lost your background. You. Now that fix it. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right. Cool. So AM three is one of the easiest ones. It has no hole. The FM1 and your FM2s sockets. So you'll notice here the only variance here in the way I'm able to tell the difference between one and the other, and they make it very cute. On the upper right hand corner, you'll notice that there is either one hole or two holes away. What do I mean? Look at the picture. It has one hole away from this white triangle. Look at the picture. It has two holes away from, you feel me? Yes or no? Nobody? Nobody no, catches that? There's yeah, a white, yeah, you I see, see a white it. rectangle right here that I'm pointing at? That little white rectangle where there's no holes? On the FM1? Yeah. yeah. Right. right, that right rectangle on the right side of it is one hole away from the big hole in the middle. Do you agree? Yes. One little hole. You see that little hole? Yep. All right. That's an FM1. Now I look at this guy. He is two holes away. That white rectangle right there is two holes from the big hole. That's an FM2. If it has no hole, FM3. I'm sorry, AM3. <laughs> FMAM. They always get me. Question? Doubt? These are the easiest one to spot when you're looking at the actual... Didn't you also tell the AM3 because it's black? Mm, it's going to also say it here, by the way. But just so you guys can, uh, you might not be able to see that very good, but it will say it up here. Just FYI. And for it being always black, I can't guarantee the colors. Never can, especially on these fancy boards that they like to change colors on it. So I can't guarantee that it's always going to be white, always going to be cream, and this is going to be black. The majority of the normal boards, yes, I would have to agree. Most likely the, the colors will match. So managing the CPU heat. Natalia, if you can help me out with this one. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, managing CPU heat. Uh, most issues that uh, arise uh, from the CPU are related to overheating. Maintaining the CPU includes 
checking the heat sink, keeping the thermal phase active and checking the system's temperature. CPU heat sink uh, melts on top of, of processor to cool heat. Thermal phase between the two aid in the uh, aid in reducing generated heat. Passive cooling is uh, used for chipset or low power older machines and and is simply a plate that draws heat away from the source. Most CPUs can uh, be purchased with a heat sink that is designed specifically for it. Thank you. Yeah, so you'll see here the actual little fan on the top and uh, please note this actually pulls air away as we said we always pull air away from uh, actual CPU or anything inside the computer we never ever ever push or air into a actual PC I do understand yes there is the gamer PCs who have a whole bunch of fans but if you'll notice the flow of air purposely goes around the front of the faceplate or in other words, if you have those three big fans, I, I understand, yes, it is pulling air and there's fans in the back that's pulling the air out, but it's not hitting the actual CPU or any of the chips directly. This air is designed to flow a certain way in and out of the case itself. Any questions on this slide? All right, so what is the heat sink? As we see, it's usually secured over the processor with a thermal paste. The passive cooling itself is the one that we see here that attaches on with those two little arms. It could have four different screws on the side and we do the X pattern to be able to attach. And lastly, we have the case fans, as I explained, which actually attach to the actual unit itself. As for submersible cooling systems, this is the one that I told you before. It looks like a fish tank where your whole system is actually submerged within mineral oil. It is the most effective, but it is the most expensive. Just like in a car, you're gonna have to maintain this oil and ensure that the top performance and ensure that the pump is pumping, everything's flowing to ensure that it doesn't damage the actual unit. Likewise with the actual liquid one here, this is actual liquid cooling. It goes through the actual whole system, cooling down all the different things as we can see here that it actually passes through specifically the actual CPU and or GPU. There's, or even passing, I think some of them even pass near the memory sticks itself. But I know it does go through the GPU and the CPU and it goes through what they call a radiator, just like in your regular car. So if, if the pump and the radiator is broken on your car, the water pump and or the radiator, you can only imagine that is gonna be catastrophic, especially if your radiator is leaking. Otherwise, if it's not moving, it will get hot very quickly and should you should see then hopefully the computer shut down to avoid damage, unless if you're lost, or you like to just push your luck. Next, I'd like to pass it over to our TA to continue with the next slide, I believe, Justin. Yep, yep. Um, all right, so now we're gonna be covering the ways of removing- I'm sorry, Justin, CPU. I do apologize for interrupting. I will stop it there. We'll come back and you can start exactly at three when we come back. We're going to lunch, a little bell came off. Left off was setting, or uh, words, um, the steps for removing and installing your CPU. Um, let's see who we can get to read for us. Who is here? Who is here? Um, Ayana, can you please read for us? Steps to removing and installing a CPU. Steps to remove or install a processor will vary depending on the motherboard architecture. So follow, it, follow the documentation specified for that board will dictate the steps. Keep the new processor in its protective bag until ready to install. Power down the system, then hold the power button for three to five seconds to discharge res residual power. Remove the door to access the PC and use ESD safety precautions. The heat sink is removed either by clips or screws. Take extra care to unscrew using the X method. Remove the heat sink placing on an ESD bag. Notice the thermal paste condition. Thank 
you, thank you. All right, so as always, whenever you're working inside of your computer, you always want to make sure you have whatever parts you're going to work with still in their bag. You don't want to take those out just to protect them so they don't get ruined by any ESD or anything. Um, always power down the system as always. Remove your loose jewelry, tie your hair back, take care of the necessary precautions to keep the PC safe as well as yourself. And then, of course, open the PC itself and then look for the CPU. That's going to basically be underneath the giant heatsink. To remove it, just like you do with the motherboard, use the X method so that way you don't accidentally break off any of the parts or, um, yeah, break off the parts, mess up the connections. You want to just take care, take it out as safely as possible. All right, so on to the next slide. All right, next slide. Let's see who I can get. Um, Michael, could you read for us, please? Steps to removing and installing a CPU. Most CPU sockets have an arm to unlatch, which will release the CPU. Open the socket by pushing down the socket lever and gently pushing it away from the socket to, to lift the lever. As you fully open the socket lever, the socket load plate opens. You're on mute, by the way, if you're talking. Uh, Justin. Oh, okay. I thought I lost connection there for a second. Um, but yes, the CPU, it's very simple to remove it. All you have to do is move the little lever. That might be a little difficult to remove at first because sometimes um, it's a little stuck. You have to work with it sometimes. And it also varies depending on um, each model and each brand. Cause I know I've worked on one, which was very hard to actually um, remove for me. Cause it was just so stuck in there. But others, it's just a very simple movement. Just push it down and just move it away. Um, on to the next slide. We'll go ahead and we'll get Hmm. We'll go ahead and get walking to read for us, if you can. A step, uh, when removing the old CPU, take extra care to hold on the edges, protecting the pins from being bent. Then store inside an ESD bag. Remove the new CPU from its bag, being careful to hold it by the edges. Look carefully at the socket to locate an indicator at which direction the CPU will sit. Some have red, yellow, arrow triangles to match up the CPU with others. You may have notches that will align. Thank you, thank you. As he mentioned, the best way, and honestly, when it comes to any computer parts, the best way to remove it is by holding it on the sides. That's to be able to protect it and prevent it from being damaged. And then when it comes to the CPU, it's really important to just lift it out and even place it just straight up. You don't want to go in at an angle at all because that can actually damage the little pins at the bottom. I believe it was Kelly that said in one of his classes that they dropped the CPU and damaged like half the pins, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, you really have to be careful when you're taking it out and even placing it back in. Um, when it comes to placing it back in, the arrow is very important to note where that is because that shows you the proper alignment for it to be placed correctly into the CPU. If it doesn't go in without any effort, you have it slightly misaligned or just completely misaligned. So you have to remember that CPUs take little to no effort to actually be placed back in. Um, on to the next slide, we'll go ahead and we'll get um, Kevin, if you could read for us, please. Steps to removing and installing a CPU, four out of five. 
lock arm when CPU is in place. Thermal paste is applied to the top of the CPU the size of the top of a pencil eraser. If purchasing a new CPU with heat sink, check to see if thermal paste is already on unit before applying to CPU. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, as always, remember your thermal paste, please, because we don't need metal to metal, as Lazaro knows very well. Um, you don't want to put too much because then that will um, prevent the heat from actually going through. And you don't want to put too little because then that'll just dry it up and it won't make a proper connection. You want to use about the size of a, I believe it's a, an eraser head of your pencil. And that should be perfect, the perfect amount to create that connection it needs between the CPU and the heat sink for the heat to transfer between the two. And then on to the last slide for me, at least. Um, let's go ahead and get. Benjamin, can you please read for us? Um, place the heat sink on top of the processor and secure to board. If required, connect the power cord from the cooler fan to the four pin CPU fan header on the motherboard near the processor. Replace the door and power on system to test. Mm -hmm. So pretty much just like you would take it off, you want to place the heat sink back on top of the processor, use the X method again to be able to re-screw in any screws that are necessary. That way you don't break any connections that are there. You apply the heat sink back on with an even amount of pressure and then reconnect any of the fans that you have connected <coughs> to it. And then, you know, pray that it worked. Um, and that's it for me. So now I believe I'm passing it on to Marvin. All right. So thank you, Justin. So we just learned how to remove and install a new CPU. So on this next slide, you're going to you're going to um, see a little video that's going to allow you to put into visual what we've just expressed um, through Ju uh, Justin's breakdown. So we can start the video now. Hi there, this is Ranjit from tech2bus.com and in this video we're going to install Intel processor on this uh, motherboard and the motherboard that you're seeing is the OSIS motherboard based on the Intel Z77 chipset and this supports both the Sandy Bridge and the Ivy Bridge chips uh, based on the LGA socket 1155 and I'm going to use a LGA 1155 chip on the same and the general thing before attempting to do something like this is that you notice this is the motherboard and the thing that you have to keep in mind is uh, any static electricity that you might have built up should be uh, dissipated before even you touch the motherboard because it can uh, damage the motherboard so i suggest wearing a anti uh, static wristband or grounding yourself before attempting to do the same and for this test let me move the motherboard I'm using a stock Intel kit in which we get this uh, uh, CPU cooler and the chip itself and uh, if you take out the CPU cooler as you see the thermal paste is already pre-applied so I'm not going to apply the thermal paste here but if you're using an aftermarket air cooler or something like that you might need to apply the thermal paste on the chip and this is the actual motherboard uh, let me just zoom in a little bit because this is the area where we're going to work. And the first thing you know, do is gently press this and move this and open this latch. And this latch will open this way. And now you need to open the processor that you have. Do notice that this is the processor and you should not touch this area. Gently lift it and let me just move the motherboard and let me show you one more thing that is uh, a little bit important. Let me see. Uh, yeah, if you notice here, you can see these two notches and 
on the socket of the motherboard also you will have similar two notches let me break the motherboard now and as you can see here are the two notches so and we also have an arrow over here and we have an arrow on this so you just gently place the chip and it should sit down and now what you have to do is bring back this plate like this and depress the lever do note that you might have to apply a little bit of pressure that is okay now you have installed the chip now what you have to do is now we are going to install this fan on the same and to do that it's uh, also pretty easy let me show you the motherboard actually uh, let me just zoom out a little bit and if you notice we have these four holes over here and our stock Intel cooler will mount there and let me just zoom in a bit so you get a better view and what we do is we gently place this, this over here over the four holes approximately and those four pins should just go down gently and now what we do is hold on to the processor like this and just depress and you'll get a clicking sound and do the same for the next one and proceed with the others you should get this clicking sound that you have heard that means we have fixed the CPU cooler and now the last thing that we need to do is let me show you the same we your motherboard should have a header like this known as the CPU fan and you now just need to attach the CPU fan and that's it and that's how you have installed your CPU on your motherboard Stop it, Diego. <clears throat> and so um, to go back on that, do you guys recall him telling us what type of CPU he had? And in relation to that CPU, what motherboard he was using. So he made sure that that information was was available and right off right off top. So we knew what generation it was and what type of what type of um intel uh chips that could be used like the sandy bridge ones uh which are the newer intel generation chips so we saw one we had um, your, your classmates read about one and we'll initially at the end actually do it together but right now i want to get someone to read who hasn't read, uh, let's see. I can read. I like it, Aprilis. you will talk about the installation pitfalls here. Okay. <clears throat> Old pin grid array processor is stuck in socket. Too much force might cause some of the pins to break off inside the socket. Solution, use balanced force to lift up the old processor. If a pin breaks off, use tweezers to pull the pin out. Thermal paste has fused the CPU to the heat sink. Solution, keep CPU locked in the socket, unlatch or unscrew heat sink from board. Slowly and carefully twist, twist the heat sink to dislodge. The arm holding the, la the LAN grid array CPU in the socket won't latch. Solution, in a LAN grid array, there is a ZIF. Let's stop if the right arm there. won't go back, down. Let's stop, right, Be sure. let's stop right there. Uh, anybody know what ZIF stands for? Zero insertion, Zero insertion force. force. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I haven't, that it hasn't come up a lot, but ZIF, Zero Insertion Force. I just wanted to make sure you guys had that uh, acronym. I apologize for this. You can keep going, sir. All right. Uh, if the arm won't go back down, be sure it is seated correctly before continuing continuing to try. The zero insertion force doesn't apply to the arm though, only the CPU fitting into the socket. 
So pushing it down to lock sometimes takes a bit of effort. Another thing that Kelly brought up as well, when he put the heat sink on and he pressed it in the middle, if you notice, he attempted to lock the heat sink down in an X pattern. He went from one corner, then he went diagonal to the other corner to try to have even pressure across that processor. Um, thermal paste fused to the CPU. Uh, had Besides what a frill is red, has anyone heard of any other method to get the heat sink dislodged from the CPU? Turning the computer on to let the heat melt it a little or soften it. Well, you're on the you're on the right track, uh, Ms. Bando, but we will not turn the computer on while we got it all halfway took, taken apart. We will not do that. We will not. Uh, you can actually use some type of fan to warm it up to cause it to like a hair fan to warm it up you can also it's been done that you can use um uh what is this you know with the mouth floss you can use floss there we go i wanted somebody to say it you use dental floss you can actually get dental floss in between it to to slightly um cause it to a jar and then pull it apart those are just some things that i've seen done in the past that work um, we can keep going. Who would like to be the next person to read out for me? I love when you volunteer. I can read. Go for it, sir. Um, common CPU problems. CPUs rarely have mechanical problems aside from perhaps a manufacturer default but on the rare occasion, it can be catastrophic. Intermittent or random issues that may arise are usually other hardware slash software problems causing the CPU to react, such as the following. Heat sink is malfunctioning. Motherboard is not maintaining a constant flow of power or intermittent problems with, co with communication. Catastrophic issues can cause the system to not boot in which a series of beeps will be heard. Checking the motherboard documentation for the code would be the first step in diagnosing if this is a CPU issue. I like that last uh, sentence. So they, uh, if your computer has any problems not passing posts, you could receive a series of beeps. And unfortunately, it's not a universal beep system. Everybody beeps differently. And that's, uh, they just like Diego said, I like to mess with you. So a certain beat pattern could let you know that you're having a CPU issue. And like the first, um, the first part said, CPUs rally, they, they rarely have issues. But when you notice them, it's apparent. It's, you're not going to be able to move too much further. So you have to identify what's causing those issues and work back to resolve that problem. Um, we can go ahead into the next slide. So as an overview, um, well, I wanna do that last then, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can go to- oh, I can stop take, share and uh, yeah. I'll let you share now. That's it, I like it. Can you, good people, see this? Yes, sir. All right. So, like I said at first, uh, Justin allowed us to um, hear hear us talk about the process. I showed a video. So now we're going to install a CPU all together. So I'm going to go to the next slide and then I'm just gonna get someone to speak about what's going on in this next slide. There's no words there. So we're walking through the process with just images telling me what the next step is. So step one, and I have this whole screen taken up. I'm gonna get somebody to just call out whoever wants. Let's go with you, Ms. Connard. You've been kind of quiet. Why do you think that picture is first? To check what motherboard it is and to check all the information is needed for yeah. installing the CPU. 
it's imperative to know what motherboard you're using before you buy a CPU. We don't, you can end up buying something that, that doesn't have the correct amount of pins or that actually don't have the correct uh, array. So you may buy the, 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 the wrong motherboard. So that's why we start there. Uh, Yusuf, what is this picture depicting? He's turning off the computer so he can work on it. Okay, and also, what else? Take it, to, take it another step further than that. You got to turn it off, true. But then what else is this allowing him to do as well? Making sure all the power is gone so you hold it for five seconds. Damn. Okay, bonus points. The things right above the uh, power, you guys notice those little slots? Anybody remember what those are? SATAs? Uh-uh, uh-uh, but it, it will hold memory. It will hold image like memory. Thanks. They, that's a, those are card readers for different type of digital cameras. You have a compact flash, XD, SD, memory stick for Sony. Do you guys remember the big digital camera uh, craze? Everybody had a camera and every camera person had a different type of memory stick. So they put those on the computer so you can pop it out of your digital camera, stick it right into uh, that computer. And that will go into one of those IO spots. So, and it's just allowing those images to go directly up to the computer without using a USB cable. So I had a computer like that back in the day. So FYI, uh, here we go. Uh, Walk, what's going on right here? I'm guessing they're washing their hands. That's cute. That's what I would have thought initially too. Uh, Mr. Mr. Andre, what's going on right here? Um, I'm just gonna throw this out. He's probably getting rid of static discharge. My guy, that's hey, it. Yeah, that's it. Know. That was a that was a, a off the wall way to show it, but yes, he is becoming discharged. This is a way to to do it. Everybody doesn't have the lovely um, ESD bracelet. So that was just the opportunity to, to uh, discharge himself. Ms. Bando, what's going on right now? Um, opening up the case. Okay, stay, stay, stay unmuted because you gotta, you, that was too easy. What's, what's here, what's going on here? Well, matter of fact, the case is open. It looks a little dusty. I don't know if you guys think that as well, but identify what, is what should be the next step? How about that? Removing components that are in the way. Damn, that is that is the case. And what's the major component that you see that's that's going to be an issue? You really make my brain work today. That is that memory or memory module? Uh, that's not really in the way. That big silver thing with the fins and the what's what's sitting on top of the processor. The heat sink. There we go. That's is that what major, that is? That's what that is. It just okay. it looks it it looks a little. It has a fan on the back. If you can follow it back, it, it does have a fan back here. But that is the heat sink. Um, and right here, we're unplugging to go along with what Ms. Bando is saying is moving all the components out of the way so we can actually work. Josh, taking over. What's going on, sir? Um, that's removing a, a fan. Okay, stay stay unmuted because we got some more. What's going on now? Uh, he's unlatching the uh, the latch for, or either latching it, either latching or unlatching the processor um, latch. Okay, we're gonna say that he has to remove the old one because it went bad. So if that's the case, he's unlatching and he's he's gonna get get that guy out. So. That went. Do you still want me to do it? Keep going, keep going. Because okay. Arturo's drinking water. I can't get him yet. Go ahead. He's uh, removing the old CPU. He is. And he's still, even though the CPU may be bad, or let's say it's not bad, it could be used somewhere else. He's following the same protocol. You don't want to touch, you want to touch the ends there. So Arturo, what's going on in this picture? He's looking at the processor. Okay, that looks like the new one too, right? But tell me, is that LGA or PGA? That's a that's an LGA. 
That's LG, like the LGA, LG. Okay. Why do yeah. you say that? Because I don't see no pins on it. Okay, that's it, man. I just wanted to make yeah. sure you, you know, you just didn't fifty fifty me. All, All right. right. <laughs> so right now he is placing the new PC by holding it on the sides as as well. He's making sure that his divots on that processor and in the socket is aligned. If you notice that, I'm trying to put my mouse right on top of it and it's gonna fall right on those as well. So, and now we're, we're pushing that guy down. I'm about to lock it in. And Mike, what's going on right now? Um, he's about to put on the thermal paste on the um, CPU. I mean, on the, uh, not the CPU, the, uh, the cover for the, uh, no, for Mike, the LGA. Man. Follow your heart, man. Follow your heart. You, you hit it right. That's, that's the CPU. Oh, I did? I'm yeah. sorry. I, I thought there's the actually a hole. Thing. It is. You, you, it, there, there's a hole in the middle, which gets confusing. When that little square comes down, there is a hole in the middle that allows that middle part there, that metal, co to come through. Exactly. It's not it's not completely covered. There is an opening for that CPU to be displayed. Nicole, what how much? How much of that thermal paste are we using? Just an eraser head size. Just the yep. And you guys, the sour cream commercial, a dollop of daisy. You guys ever seen that? Okay, never mind. It's just the eraser head size. Even? Not not much. A dollop may be too much. More, it's probably too much than an eraser head size. So follow oh, no, you what, didn't. what Cole said. <laughs> follow what the Cole said. Okay. And now we are, who, who I have up here? Somebody speak out because I can't get my screen to show me a different face. I'm seeing the same faces. Put in Re the heat sink reseating on. the heat sink. Reseating the heat sink. Ben, stay unmuted, Ben. I might use you again. I What's have, I have a quick question before okay, we move on. Uh, would... I guess he's bought the same type of processor. Would you use the same heat sink on the on a new processor? If the heat sink wasn't the issue, you can still use the heat sink. If it's still working and it's still in working fashion, there's no reason to change the heat sink. Because if you think about it, they like what my gentleman had in a YouTube video, that heat sink was designed probably directly for. He bought it as a package deal. He bought the processor and the heat sink. It was all in the same box. It was made for that processor. So this one ideally is probably is made for, it was probably all built together. It was made for that particular uh, CPU. So there's no, no need to change it out unless it was the culprit and stopped working, caused the overheating, but we would know that. Or if you're changing your cooling okay. system, like going from a fan to like a liquid cool system, you wouldn't use the same heat sink. That's also On top correct. of it, from the looks of it, he was building it. It wasn't really replacing. It was, looks to be a brand new computer because a motherboard fresh out of the box. That's also correct. Um, ben, he's doing what right now, sir? Uh, he's plugging in the fan. For that heat sink. That's right. Yep. That's right. And it's like we've seen this picture before. What do you guys think we're doing now? <laughs> Closing it back up. Closing it back up. And it's time to time to party. So I'm gonna unshare and get Diego to bring that back up for me. Thank you. So yeah, by this point, hopefully we all should be able to describe the various types of processors, articulate how to select the processor itself to match the model system needs, identify the CPU, and explain its purpose, choose the appropriate cooling method and the names for uh, the steps to be able to replace and install a processor. As for persistence and or using our little growth mindset is the only thing that will help us with the identification of common pitfalls and or symptoms. That just takes practice and obviously the more we practice, the better we get at it. Any questions or concerns in this? No. I wanted to ask, as far as um, like in laptops or like in a phone or iPad, like what do they do for like a heat sink or a fan or something? Like, 
They still use they, heat sink. It's just not they installed. still use a yeah heat sink, but uh, they don't have a fan, and that's why you see that a lot of these phones get real hot in your pocket. Okay. Uh, pocket. I have something. Mm-hmm. That uh, video uh, cleared up some things that just from reading or whatever, I hadn't gotten to visualize properly, but uh, somehow I thought you're supposed to put that uh, thermal uh, uh, paste um, on the bottom of the motherboard before you put the CPU on top of it uh, to keep it stuck Ooh, in That there. would be very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I could luck with that thought. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank God you saw the video. <laughs> yeah, you're you're you know you're much more meaner than Lazaro is. He just flat out doesn't put it, but you're just gonna go stick it right into the motherboard. What? All right, I have a competitor. Who's my competitor? Yeah, I'm you got Joshua, yeah. man. He's beat you, man. He's just gonna go <laughs> put it inside the motherboard. He says, "I'm not gonna forget about it. I'm just gonna stick it to the motherboard." Z Josh, walk walk yourself through that process. Why why does <laughs> why does why doesn't that make sense? Now well, that you know. Right, because uh, the pins, you want a secure connection from the pins or the landing grid array to whatever's at the bottom of the motherboard, the buses and everything. That's it. Do I'm you, just trying to make sure. Do you Wait. understand what the thermal paste does? Uh, it's exactly. Like a, That's why. Let me make yeah. sure we all understand what the thermal yeah. paste does. What it actually does, it, it is just like these new medicine that's coming out where they say a slow release. So instead of when the processor gets super hot all of a sudden because you rev the engine, it will release or dissipate at a certain rate the heat to the metal, which is your heat sink. Your heat sink has a constant rate, which your CPU now controls the fan. Depending on your speed, the amount of flow that needs to be removed. But that rate between the CPU and the actual um, heat sink has to be at a, 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 a certain rate. If it's metal to metal, it's going to be too fast. So as soon as I pull from that heat sink, as soon as I pull the heat away from it real quick, so the heat sink gets cold, if I don't have the thermal paste avoiding that variance of temperature, it will damage the chip. Likewise, if you have too much, now you can't dissipate or remove the heat at a, a good rate. That's all it's doing is avoiding that flow of temperature to be m more than what it's capable of going up and down. Thank you. Question. No, not a problem. Any other questions, doubts? Um, on the newer... Um chips and uh, heat sinks and stuff like that now, they are actually pre-applying the thermal paste on the uh, bottom of the heat sink. So you don't even have to worry about, you know, how much you got to put on there or whatever. You just literally just peel the laminate off of it and stick it mm -hmm. right down on top of the CPU and you're good to go. But make sure that it's there before you do it. But that's something they're doing on the newer heat sinks. And then all you would have to do is management later, like a year, every, you know, half, you know, six months, a year, be sure to remove that heat sink, make sure it's not getting all dried out and, you know, it's still doing what it needs to do. And then you might need to apply some more, but they're kind of making it a little easier now to remember to do it. But wouldn't it dry out if it's already pre-applied? It, it uh, this paste won't dry out uh, unless if there's heat. So the thermal paste stays wet. And since oxygen also is not hitting it, as he mentioned, he's peeling back something that's being covered. So it uh, just like, uh, obviously, it will. You leave it there for years, just like if you go to Home Depot and you buy the thing for the, for the bathroom, that white paste, you cool. buy it fresh from Home Depot, you leave it there for in your shed outside and you come next year, grab that same one, I bet you 10 bucks is dry. Or at least the beginning of it. Why? That heat 
inside that shed is going to obviously, but if you put it in a very uh, nice damp store, maybe where you have your wine at down in the, in the wine cellar, you people in Washington who have basements, it'll probably store much better and longer. Makes sense. Good questions. Anything else? All right, I'll be stopping the share here and the recording for this.